So let's fly over the Taquini TVET College campuses located in and around Durban. Now to set the scene, take a look at Durban Harbour. Don't imagine it as it is now, full of all the logistical equipment and cranes needed for all the huge ships coming in. Imagine it as a beautiful bay with crocodiles and hippos and elephants around and that mouth which you can see was actually mostly closed by a sandbank. So it was huge engineering problems to actually get the Durban Harbour open. So if you were one of the first indentured Indians arriving from India to work on the growing sugar plantations in around 1860 when the ship arrived it carried 342 Indians on board you'd have had to park outside the harbour and get ferried in because that sandbank hadn't been solved yet the north pier hadn't been properly built and the south pier didn't exist and it was only in 1904 Four, that big ships were able to do what we're going to do now, sail into the Durban Harbour. Famous for being Africa's busiest port and most expensive port, contributing around 20% of Durban's GDP. Now, all the cargo flowing in and out of Durban has meant that huge rail networks, road networks and pipeline networks have developed in and around Durban, often creating massive strain for the people living here. And we're not just talking traffic congestion, we're talking huge issues with pollution in this area. But it's quite fitting that the first TVET campus we're going to visit in Ambila, which is right next to the harbour, focuses only on transport and logistics. And my own understanding of logistics, just to put it out there, is where you keep the flow of goods going from the point of origin to the point where it gets to the customer. So having Ambilo as the place right next to Durban Harbour, where it's exactly that process which is happening every day, I think is a useful way to go forward. And we can do a pull out over the Durban Harbour where we actually emphasize the railway links and the huge warehousing needed to keep the harbour going. But the reason why I'm also pulling out this way is on your bottom left you will see the coloured suburb of Wentworth formed in the 1960s with the Group Areas Act and they were able to get their own TVET college going. It was known in apartheid times as the L.C. Johnson College. And although conditions at the college were really poor, they didn't have much equipment, it developed a good reputation as being a trade school, doing electrical, engineering, welding, boiler making, you could do building, you could do motor and diesel mechanics and panel beating and hairdressing and all that kind of stuff. And it still has that focus. It still does electrical engineering and civil engineering on the one side, and it's got a strong skill focus on the other side. Although the post-apartheid government has spent quite a lot of money in updating the campus and ensuring it's got better equipment. Now when gold was discovered in the Witwatersrand, there was a huge urgency to get a railway line all the way from Durban to Joburg. And that happened by around about 1895. And that meant that a lot of rich Transvalers came down and started to set up their holiday homes in Durban, which made it a major holiday destination. Although with the extension of the North and South Pier, what happened was all the sand which would get onto these beaches wasn't getting there because of the pier, causing all this beach to be stripped away. So sand actually has to be pumped onto this beach to keep the tourists happy. So let's curve around the mouth of the Umgeni River towards the ridge with those spectacular flats on the one side. That's kind of upmarket hostel living in comparison to what's going on in Mlazi and flying to the Sentec campus in Morningside. Now this does travel and tourism. It does hospitality. Those are its two major focuses. On top of that, it does financial accounting and it does art and design. 
And I want to go from this historically white Morningside campus to the historically Indian Springfield campus. Now, there was a large community of free Indians who landed up farming over there after they were released from their five-year indentured labor on the sugar fields. And they'd work on those beautiful zones on the Umgani River growing vegetables. The market gardeners, they were called, at great risk when the Umgani would come flooding down. And in fact, in 1917, 400 market gardeners tragically died in this area. Although there were great acts of heroism as well, with a number of them being saved. And right here is where the Springfield campus is located. And you can do business studies over here. So you can do business management and marketing management and HR and public relations. You can also do mechanical engineering where you can learn to be a diesel mechanic. But what you'll notice on the left is the Kennedy Road settlement, which through an organization which started there the Abakhlali Base Mjondolo, have started some very interesting ideas on technical education, using the work of Paula Freer to set up community-based education, where the community takes charge of its own skills and teaches itself what it needs and how to do it, using the people in the community to develop those skills itself. And set right next to the Springfield campus, it's a really important juxtaposition about two ways we pursue the future of technical and vocational education in South Africa. Just up from Springfield is the historically Indian suburb of Asheville, with all its streets named after flowers and famed for its actual wonderful sporting fields, which were really useful for the Indians living in the area. And actually the first Indian swimming pool call out to that in 1957, even in apartheid times. Now you can see it was a gorgeous old teacher's college and over there you can do safety and society, that police qualification, you can do education and development and you can do public management. And let's now lift off from Asheville and fly all the way across to Cato Manor which basically was a farm in 1865 where the farm owner starts to lease and sell plots of land to Indian market gardeners. And they then often leased a little bit of that land on to African families. So by 1918, there was like 30,000 informal dwellers over there and the black and the Indian people lived together on the one side, but there were definite antagonisms. And in 1949, there were terrible race riots there where a whole number, I think about 137 Indians were actually killed at that point. Then what happened was the apartheid government tried to turn it into a white suburb and basically tried to get rid of the Indians there and send them to Chatsworth and Umlazi and Kwamashu. And it became a highly contested area until in the 1980s, the apartheid government finally conceded and it became an Indian area again. And it's over here that you have the Cato Manor campus. Now it offers the pre-vocational learning program, which you use for people who need to get access into the technical and vocational space. And it also offers hospitality and you can do some skills there along with electrical engineering. And that gives us first sight of the Etiquini TVET College campuses located in and around Durban with its spectacular harbour, the place where in 1860, 342 indentured Indians arrived and currently sitting with one and a half million Indians in South Africa, the largest settlement of Indians outside of India, with Tequini College holding together these Indian influences on the one side, along with the whole coloured tradition with the L.C. Johnson Tech College, which is now at Melbourne, and then also the old historical white traditions located in Morningside and Tequini College, holding these all together now in the new South Africa.